Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's uh, it's like homecoming. I was uh, alumni of the first batch, I must tell you. So this was 20 years, 23 years ago. So such a pleasure to be back uh, with friends. Uh, so I'll uh, speak about an area where there are there are few knowns, but there are a lot of unknowns, and particularly last three years, a lot of uh, better understanding and a lot of efforts have been made. Uh, so uh, you hear all these uh, issues. Uh, we have been uh, very much aware about uh, uh, reactions following DPT vaccination. Similarly, recently, TTS syndrome, myocarditis. So we have, we have been hearing a lot of things. So we'll try to see how much we do understand today. And the other thing is the reaction whenever injection is given vaccine reaction, uh, local pain and fever occurs. What does that mean? So what is uh, what is the characteristics of an ideal vaccine? And these are the ones. But unfortunately, we do not have a single one which has all these qualities. And But so a compromise has to be made. Uh, and uh, re repeatedly we talk about risk benefit and uh, risk uh, uh, w whether the benefit is more or safety issues become a major issue. Now AFI, when we talk about AFI, first uh, our prerequisite is that there is a temporal relationship, even follows the vaccination. The second is that initial evidence has come, and you must have heard about signal detection and that is that there is an epidemiological and a statistical association and uh, and you you rule out that it is not a simple chance occurrence then at several places within the same region country or in different parts if you see the similar uh, consistency of association then you start going into greater depth and try to look for this specificity and also the biological plausibility. So a lot of what we are going to discuss is these issues of biological plausibilities or the mechanism and uh, issues of dose response also. It is important whether sometimes or many times the, the reactogenicity may be more in the first one or in the second one or the adverse event occurs. For example, myocarditis has been reported mostly with the second dose of mRNA vaccine. So those issues are important and we need to understand that. So this is just a revision. I'm sure you're all aware of uh, the various types and the frequency with which they occur. The other important point and which has really uh, gained a lot of importance in last three years, particularly this AESIs, adverse events of special interest. So they have not been reported before, but are uh, can be potentially be causally associated with the vaccines. And this has particularly become important because you know that because of the pandemic and because of the imperatives of the, uh, of the uh, situation, a lot of uh, long-term safety assessments were not available. And therefore, a preemptive effort has been made to see that uh, lo looking for some of these events and trying to see whether epidemiologically they can be associated and then work further or even biologically, mechanistically. Now, the, this is a very important slide. And we need to understand that vaccine does not just contain or that vial or the shot which has been given to you or the drops which have been put into the mouth of a child. And now, as we were talking, mucosal uh, vaccine, COVID vaccine, few drops, uh, the Indian vaccine, mucosal vaccine is given five dro four drops in each nostril. That is how it is to be given. We need to understand what are the ingredients because each ingredient can be, uh, uh, can be the uh, cause or can be incriminated for various factors. So active ingredient, adjuvants, antibiotics, stabilizers, preservatives, and trace components. But particularly important is we, most of the times we get stuck with the antigen, active ingredient. But adjuvants don't forget that because they are also, adjuvants after all, why are they added? To immune 
immune potentiation or boosting the immune responses. So they can, they are also associated with adverse events. And particularly we talk when we know, we uh, discuss, and it was mentioned uh, twice in the morning session uh, about uh, the influenza vaccine associated with narcolepsy. A particular brand was there, which has a particular type of antigen uh, adjuvant. So uh, and just to give you an example, uh, we, we have this pentavalent vaccine and which has large number of other issue, uh, other uh, ingredients. Similarly, this rota vaccine or we talk about Covishield or this is in India, it is called Covishield, uh, while the rest of the world, we call it AstraZeneca. But here I must tell you that uh, I was just uh, uh, thanking Andy that because of their efforts and working with AstraZeneca, I do not know how many of us in the audience are aware that India used 1.8 billion doses of one this one vaccine alone, and the and uh, this uh, adenovector vaccine, and probably it saved us. So uh, vaccines have tremendous uh, value. So all vaccines have different composition and same, same, basically same platform, but manufactured at different, uh, also have differences. So please look at the, uh, the composition of the vaccine. Now, what are the various, uh, mechanisms, uh, either known or some of them are hypothetical or, uh, kind of uh, being worked out? Immune mediated reactions are the most important and we will discuss it in uh, next few minutes. Then viral and bacterial activity, injection related, even when injection is given, what are the, a new dimension which has been added and it was taken up by stage on a, uh, uh, by Sage in a big way is about the psychological and stress reactions. There is a very uh, 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 intimate relationship or access between brain and psychology. And it is a reciprocal action and it affects the immune system. And finally, the genetic issues and other several unknowns. Now, immune mediated, we have heard a lot from the previous speaker about uh, CD4, CD8 cells, plasma cells, complement activation system, which is the downstream activities Sometimes it is hypersensitivity related reactions. Immune complex, if the antibody, uh, antibodies are huge and you get Arthur's kind of reaction. Molecular mimicry, we'll talk a little more about that. And vaccine associated enhanced disease. You must have heard about, uh, uh, the, the dengue vaccine in recent times, both in Philippines and Mexico, we had difficulties. And similarly, previously with RSV vaccine and, and these vaccines were withdrawn. So, uh, it was, some of us asked the question in, the AFIs are due to both innate host response as well as the adaptive immune response. Innate means immediately when the uh, antigen or the vaccine enters the body. And uh, this is associated, so you get fever, seizures, uh, neuritis may occur, respiratory distress may occur, and you have the various mechanisms. And uh, so innate response, it's an over response. And so most of the times the initial reactogenicity is because of this. And subsequently the adaptation which occurs the body responds and uh, starts uh, kind of responding to the antigens uh, which have been given. And that also leads to hyperimmunization. One of the very good example of hyperimmunization, I do not know, uh, some, some have, are affected more. If you have been given a tetanus toxide two or three times before and later when you give, the whole arm may be pseudoparalysis may occur. And it is a very good example of hyperimmunization syndrome. And this may be, occur with us as anaphylaxis, autoimmunity. And uh, then uh, you may also get infections. And just to give a little better uh, understanding that when 
we have the injection. There is tissue injury as well as immunostimulants, both the antigen or the vaccine ingredient as well as adjuvant. Don't forget that. And it leads to local production of cytokines, vasodilators, complement factors, and prostaglandins. And this leads to local reaction. So it is uh, uh, just not a physical problem. It is an immune response which is taking place. And you may have general symptoms, headache, fever, fatigue. You may, And particularly we have noticed during COVID for one or two days, some vaccines were causing, particularly AstraZeneca. First one day or two days, people may not be able to go to the work also, a substantial proportion. And uh, then uh, and these are standard immunological. They're type 1, hypersensitivity, or anaphylaxis. It is very interesting for almost the whole spectrum of vaccines it has been seen. Uh, the incidence is one in a million. It may vary between 0.6 million to 1.8 million per, uh, 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 one per uh, uh, 0.6 to 1.8 million doses administered. So one has to be always be, but whenever it occurs, it is it has two sides of the story. If a prompt reaction uh, action is taken, you save the individual. If we do not, if we are in a remote area, particularly in our kind of settings, then it can be a disaster and we, it can it is fatal. And that is why now as part of program, uh, I, I understand there are program managers in this, adrenaline is provided to the, uh, to the health workers. Then uh, the interaction between uh, the toll-like receptors and antigen adjuvant this is a more uh, uh, a kind of a sustain and it occurs several days. Uh, it may be three, four days or up to three weeks also later. This kind of a reaction can occur. And it is primarily because of the release of various cytokines, prostaglandins, uh, interferons, interleukins. And uh, this may cause a lot of local reaction, exfoliation and swellings or nodule formations may occur. And then delayed hypersensitivity. These are standard. And all these uh, 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 can occur variably in different, uh, uh, in, with different vaccines. Probably the platforms also make a difference. And I think for the first time, so many platforms have simultaneously come up. We need to uh, collect the data and look at it a little more carefully that whether it, uh, uh, what are the differences. And uh, we do know with certain vaccines, uh, the reactions may be more with a particular type. So large local uh, reactions uh, can, can be usually are because of adjuvant uh, uh, or antigen and TLR associated or they can be arthritis reaction. Subcutaneous nodules or local eczema, delayed hypersensitivity, you may have itching and all skin lesions may happen. This may particularly happen when alum, uh, aluminum salts are used as part of adjuvants. And uh, uh, with practically every vaccine platform, this has happened. Subcutaneous nodules, uh, there have been case reports with mRNA vaccines and AstraZeneca vaccines also. And these are all uh, uh, Arthur's reaction, type 3 hypersensitivity or TLR related activity. Now, now coming the more uh, complicated or uh, uh, areas where uh, this is more recently understood. Now, uh, as pediatrician, I'm a pediatrician, but I'm sure there are uh, several others. We use DPT vaccine at uh, first six months, three doses are given. And uh, uh, the, the seizures within first 72 hours of giving the vaccine uh, are not uncommon. Most of us must have seen that. And uh, initially it was thought a, a kind of a localized, uh, a kind of a, a reaction to the, uh, uh, to reactogenicity to the, uh, uh, to, to pertussis antigen. But over the time, these, these are uh, wonderful studies which have been done during the last 15 years, which have showed that 
these individuals are genetically predisposed. And when you follow them up, they many of them have later on epileptic disorders. So they are genetically predisposed. And when a vaccine is given, you find, and uh, these are the various uh, 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 the, the uh, mutations which occur uh, in these individuals. So many times a vaccine is incriminated, but it is actually the child herself or himself who is predisposed. So that's a good example. Now we have heard recently a lot about uh, the vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia. This was first particularly reported with AstraZeneca vaccine. And it has uh, uh, thrombocytopenia, thrombosis, and and uh, thrombosis in very unusual places, cerebral vascular uh, si uh, sinuses, uh, in the uh, abdominal veins, and the pulmonary uh, uh, in the lungs. But just looking at thrombocytopenia, this has been reported for practically every vaccine, especially for the measles vaccine. And uh, uh, it occurs in the uh, usually any time between the first six weeks, usually after first week and then up to three weeks it can occur. And uh, one has to reduce. So thrombocytopenia is something which occurs not infrequently. And uh, uh, various mechanisms have been suggested. And these include uh, just activation of platelet factors, development of autoimmune antibodies, active, uh, interaction with the endothelium, and all these factors can lead to uh, reduction in the thrombocytes, thrombocytopenia, and associated complications. And now when we look at uh, uh, the COVID vaccines, it is interesting. It is seen with practically every COVID we have, uh, the data is available with AstraZeneca vaccine, with mRNA vaccine also, with inactivated uh, virus vaccines as well. And uh, the whole, uh, but the risk is maximum uh, with, uh, with vectored, uh, adenovirus vectored vaccines. The Vaccine components lead to production of antibodies. So uh, uh, it, but that is only one component. There is a clotting reaction. There is uh, 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 the PF4 protein and antibodies against that come up and which later on leads to uh, uh, consumption of platelets or the reduction in the plates and thrombocytopenia occurs. And usually it occurs anywhere between the end of first week up to four weeks, four days to 27 days. And uh, if uh, it can be managed, it, it mimics heparin-induced thrombocytopenia uh, like illness. And uh, it, as I said, it has been also seen with a lot of other conditions also. La surgeries can also precipitate this kind of situation. So it appears the the, the system, the human body is a kind of a susceptible platform where any such kind of stress and uh, it's, it's seen that this particular a particular type of vaccine was creating that platform which led to the problem. And uh, as I said, with, uh, uh, with the AstraZeneca vaccine, the risk is much higher as compared to uh, as compared to the other vaccines, it has been compared with uh, mRNA vaccine. And the other thing is that the risk within the first four weeks is more than the second four weeks. So uh, 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 although in certain uh, parts of the uh, globe, the, the reporting was much less, but probably the surveillance system has not been so uh, good or sensitive. But the problem probably is uh, universal. This is a very recent paper which indicates, uh, which is uh, in an experimental that when IV, the vaccine was given in the mice, it led to it uh, TTS-like syndromes. Thrombocytopenia occurs and thrombosis also occurs. And uh, 
it appears that uh, when intramuscular injections are given, and particularly when such a large number of vaccines are be, uh, numbers are being uh, given, it's, uh, I'm sure all of us are aware that almost seven or eight billion injections have been given on, for the whole age range, except very young children. Uh, these uh, events can occur. Uh, the small amount can leak into the venous system. Another uh, important, which is now labeled as AESIs, again, guillain barre syndrome, etiology is not very well clear, but considered to be an autoimmune phenomena. Autoantibodies are produced against the Schwann cell sheath, and uh, that can, uh, and it is, uh, it is thought that some kind of a molecular mimicry occurs between antigen and human peripheral components. And if that is the one, it may. And uh, just, I, uh, I think a paper published uh, four or six weeks ago shows that with Zika virus, uh, GBS can occur. In fact, the, the GBS which occurs with following Jiva, uh, Zika virus is uh, uh, progresses very rapidly and a much more severe disease. And again, the mechanism is uh, suggested uh, to be a molecular mimicry. So uh, these cross-reactive uh, antibodies are there uh, against the Schwann cell. GBS has also been reported following COVID vaccines. And um, uh, again, uh, you're aware of uh, Janssen uh, uh, single dose adenovector 26 uh, vectored vaccine. The risk uh, has been calculated to be 20 times higher. Again, the issue is with different vaccine uh, platforms, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the condition can occur. Narcolepsy. This issue uh, last year also uh, I was mentioning that uh, here again there is a uh, there appears to be a, the the in Scandinavian countries where when uh, pandemics uh, the influenza vaccine was introduced it was practically associated with this in young individuals and uh, uh, it is uh, that particular uh, narcolepsy is associated with. Uh, a particular HLA type and uh, uh, again appears to be an autoimmune disorder uh, and antibodies are produced which cross react with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with the brain tissue and giving rise to here role of uh, adjuvant I said role of adjuvant has been because a particular brand of vaccine was being considered and uh, there are these further studies which show about the significant association of this particular HLA with uh, uh, narcolepsy type 1. And, uh, and so, again, uh, a, a genetic susceptibility and on top of that, a, a antigen which uh, induces autoimmunity and neuronal damage. Myopar myopericarditis. This is again uh, with mRNA it has been talked about particularly in the young individuals and males and uh, again, there are several uh, 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 hypotheses which are being talked about which includes antigen mimicry which talks about uh, the, uh, the, the dysregulated uh, immune uh, uh, background of the individual and where it precipitates myocarditis. And uh, mostly it has been reported with the second dose of mRNA, but also with AstraZeneca and other vaccines it is reported. So th there is a cross-reactivity between spike protein and the cardiac antigens, and that leads to this uh, antigenic mimicry, and autoantibodies may also be produced. Now, this is another uh, animal experiment where it shows, just like with uh, AstraZeneca, when intravenous vaccine is given to mice, 
it leads to TTS-like syndrome. Similarly, this uh, paper very uh, interestingly shows the mechanistics that whether there is a possibility when such large number of individuals are given vaccine, small amount of uh, vaccine, if it leaks into the system, does it lead to, here it is, myocarditis. Although myocarditis associated with mRNA is mild, self-limiting, and over next few week, a few days or weeks, it recovers. But these are issues which need to be, uh, I mean, one has to uh, look at it that it may be either uh, not a single mechanism may be working in this whole uh, pathology. Pregnancy, I understand there will be a discussion on pregnancy, but basically one has to be worried about pregnancy because a TH1 kind of a situation is there where they may respond differently to whatever vaccine is given. Vaccine-associated enhanced disease is a very confusing state. Although uh, we talk about uh, uh, with uh, dengue vaccine recently, RSV, I think many of us may not be so much aware, but dengue is last few years. The question is, how do you differentiate it from a vaccine failure? So still the definition issues and uh, the conditions which lead to vaccine-associated enhanced disease or antibody-enhanced disease need to be understood a little better. Coming to, towards the end uh, is uh, this issue of biosocial model, biopsychosocial model, uh, stage two took it up. Particularly the reason is that psychological stress may affect many as integration of the functioning of the immune system, central nervous system, and endocrine system. And this psychoneuroimmunology shows that there are changes in antibody levels and complement levels and acute response levels and uh, various kinds of responses occur. So, and it has been seen uh, in India, in the first three months, severe disease, a uh, severe AEFI were due to hospitalization and 84% of them due to women were getting hospitalized. And it appears the stress factor was one of the factors, although they all recovered. So there are programmatic errors. We need to be very careful. And uh, the important point is that factors for fatal immunization occur when we don't take care of these four factors. We use multi-dose, particularly in low and middle income countries. And errors can occur in terms of diluents, these issues for screening patients for immunocompromised state, and uh, uh, distinction between vaccines and medicines one has to, because many times uh, uh, it has happened for measles, uh, the muscle relaxant was used as a diluent and the individuals die. So uh, this has to be taken care of. And this is the only one. Then uh, there are two conditions, infant death, sudden infant deaths. No association has been found, although there are still talking about in terms of some rare genetic disorders which are associated with cardiac arrhythmias and into susception and rotavirus vaccine. Although in the rota shield was withdrawn, the recent ones, recent and the more recent vaccines are considered relatively safe, but still the mechanism is not known for these conditions. So to summarize, the AFIs are because of these local reactions, systemic reactions, these are all immune mediated. Allergic reaction is extremely uncommon. Autoimmune reactions, as I said, does occur. There is molecular mimicry. There is genetic susceptibility. And occasionally vaccines may get contaminated. So, and besides this, there are, so overall, if you look at it, since morning I've been hearing, and these, several of these, personal genome, age, microbiome, metabolic state, present and past experimental exposures, organ development, personal behaviors and inter intercurrent illness, all these, but questions still remain. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Question. One here. Go ahead. Thank you very much for such a very lucid uh, presentation. My name is Michael from Nigeria. So during the COVID um, vaccination, at the peak of the vaccination, 
when people started manifesting some adverse events between clinicians, we started arguing, should we use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for those that have severe uh, adverse reactions like uh, fever, high-grade fever, severe local reactions. So what are your thoughts about the impact of NSAIDs on immune response, immediate immune response following vaccination? Thank you. So first of all, these reactogenicity responses are self-limiting, even if you don't give any medicines. Uh, in tw- uh, 24 to 72 hours, they will all settle down as these are transient immunological reactions. But at best, uh, uh, one has to be giving it for symptomatic, and I would not preemptively, but uh, responding to the symptoms. Simple, like paracetamol seems to be working well, and uh, that is the usual practice. Okay, question here. Amir from Cameroon, thank you so much for your presentation. My question is kind of similar in the same line. It's about drug interactions and vaccines. So I want to know, are there any studies that have been conducted to see how administering certain drugs and administering certain vaccines would interact? Because we really don't have a lot of data on that. And who knows, it could be causing several adverse events in our countries. Thank you. So... um... Several uh, studies are available when, and particularly it happened during the pandemic that vaccines were particularly indicated for those with immunocompromised state, whether they were on anti-cancer drugs, on prolonged steroids, and similarly those with comorbidities. So usually uh, 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 there are not many publications, but the ones which are available, there are two messages coming out of it, that those who are on immunocompromised, compromising drugs, and immunosuppression is taking place, additional dose of the vaccine may be required because immune response may not be sufficient. But if somebody is on uh, uh, anti-diabetics or anti-cardiac drugs or uh, anti-epileptics, usually the, the problem is not there. Okay, yes. Sir, I'm Natasha um, from WHO India. Sir, uh, I want to know if there is a correlation between efficacy of uh, vaccine and AEFI. I mean, I'm asking this question because uh, in this scenario, we have had Covaxin and Covishield. And uh, while uh, Covishield is, was uh, reported to be more effica- uh, efficacious, it had uh, more AFIs as well. So any correlation between both, sir? So... Today, in hindsight, it appears the vaccine efficacy has to be seen differently today. We know that none of the vaccines were able to interrupt the transmission. So it was not. The second is vaccine efficacy. Initially, we were not sure what vaccine efficacy, whether it is. So the second efficacy is preventing symptomatic disease. Third is preventing serious disease. And fourth is preventing death. And we find at the end, in hindsight, that most of the vaccines were having very similar kind of efficacy or effectiveness. And maybe my some of the other friends can com- comment. They were reasonably effective in preventing serious disease, hospitalization, and death. The difference is maybe for symptomatic disease. Interruption of infection was not occurring. And therefore, this kind of a correlation, what you're talking about, probably is not correct. And uh, uh, and that may also indicate that if somebody is, uh, some, some vaccine in preclinical is having severe AUFI, it means maybe more effective. No, that's not correct. Because AUFI is a different uh, mechanistic issue, and one has to take care of that. Here and over there. It's... Uh, Matt Daly, USA. So related, what is the relationship between reactogenicity or systemic reactogenicity and, and risk of AEFIs? I, I think uh, systemic reactogenicity uh, is is being labeled as AEFI. The question is severity of this reactogenicity. That is one. 
and the other is now as we understand the more serious variety there is severe where you have hyperparaxia which causes concern but serious ones which lead to hospitalization or are potentially fatal and as you have seen that various other mechanisms are also being talked about they are, need to be investigated the one particularly i was uh, uh, interested was about this uh, uh, immuno encephalopathy uh, sorry uh, vaccine encephalopathy where underlying genetic susceptibility was their mutations so it, it probably cannot be afi is far more complex than we thought about it it's just not clinical component it has several dimensions immunological is only one but there are genetic uh, uh, components and the third recent the other dimension which i mentioned was about uh, about this psych uh, biosocial uh, dimension where stress and uh, panic associated with any vaccination vaccine or disease makes changes in the immune system and that may also make a difference in terms of how the vaccine responds maybe on this link between immuno and react tomorrow I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it on the on the adjuvant talk so we can come back to that Hi. Uh, uh, yeah, no yeah. question over there. Hi, uh, Tanya Shuchuk, um, based in the UK. I, uh, thanks for for your talk. I had a question on the on the temporal nature of um, the AFI characteristics. You mentioned um, Guillain Barr syndrome, and I think I noticed on the on the chart that sort of it was sort of up to eighty five days um, after vaccination that this might appear, which seems like a quite a long timeline, and is is sort of that sort of how, how, how does that come about that that is um, that we're making that association and why 85 days could we imagine cases happening a year after etc thanks so uh, a lot of uh, actually doing causality assessment for AFI is a challenge and you use uh, self-controlled case series a study design and those novel studies have to be done and uh, so uh, linking the two together, uh, is 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 quite challenging so the question of gbs which you have said that when you see that there was nothing no other infection or no other triggering factor vaccine was the only one so uh, in fact we have been lo recently looking at uh, kawasaki syndrome and whether it is associated and similarly at Ad adam which occurs 3 months later after a uh, exposure so there is this time limitation and some of the vaccines I mean, some of the, it is being talked it may go up to two years also so uh, uh, one has to keep the mind open in terms of if uh, if if something like that is happening okay there's too many <laughs> too many hands so I, I give two questions maybe you were and and then uh, okay you go sorry um, with regards to the uh, JM from the Philippines, with regards to the thrombocytopenia for the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine, um, is there data whether it's related to the actual the adenovirus chimp uh, vector, whether it's, it may, may be the one causing the thrombos thrombocytopenia? I actually could not get the question correctly. Um, yeah, Can you repeat, the... please? For the AstraZeneca yes. COVID-19 vaccine, is there data, um, you know, possibly associating the thrombocytopenia with a adenovirus chimp vector? So, uh, uh, as I said, one very important thing that TTS or ITTS has been observed with large number of vaccines, starting from inactivated vaccines with uh, adenovector vaccines, whether it is AstraZeneca or even uh, the other one, 26 uh, adenovector, uh, 26 uh, vector vaccine and mRNA vaccines. The intensity is maximum with AstraZeneca. So probably the mechanisms are similar as I tried to say that thrombocytopenia can occur with a large number of vaccines and other triggering factors are there. And TTS-like syndrome has also been reported with certain surgical procedures. So it appears that a ecosystem is created in the body. And 
that drives this development of syndrome. And uh, uh, what we have observed that it was maximum with AstraZeneca during the last three years. Here. Stephanie Vicker, I work in Papua New Guinea and for several reasons, um, adrenaline often isn't available or if it is the healthcare workers doing the vaccines aren't allowed to take out adrenaline with them. So given it's relatively rare to have an anaphylactic event, how risky is it to actually go out, particularly some quite remote outreach, um, several days without any adrenaline or is that totally inadvisable? So for adrenaline, uh, India is choosing it as part of our national programs. We, we did a technology assessment and in our neighborhood, I do not know if anybody is from Sri Lanka, we, uh, we learned from them that it is safe. And uh, adrenaline otherwise in the recommended dose is safe across the spectrum, uh, almost uh, from early childhood up to the end. And what we found, we particularly used it for measles rubella campaign. Uh, we have uh, the program manager who was leading at that time. We practically eliminated anaphylaxis associated death. The second point is adrenaline has a shelf. It's a very cheap drug, but it has a very short shelf life, six months or so. And therefore it needs repeated changing. And uh, so that is the major uh, kind of a challenge for the program to see that adrenaline vials are replaced at the right time. But otherwise, safety-wise, um, as we have seen, it, it is very safe. Okay, I have one space, one question. You. <laughs> I was allowed by the, by the director. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Thank you very much for squeezing me in. Yes. Sorry, um, I, I'm Angela from Oxford in the UK. Um, I was just interested in the data you showed on um, intravenous um, injection of Chadox leading to thrombosis, thrombocytopenia, and also of the mRNA vaccine causing my pericarditis. My only sort of experience of intravenous administration of vaccines is regarding um, whole sporozoite vaccines for malaria, for which there have been no safety signals, but um, obviously big questions about logistics and deployability more generally. Mm. Um, so my question is, this was obviously all uncovered during in, in the context of COVID. Has there been any prior safety signals with um, intravenous vaccines um, from either previous animal models or already human data? And, and what implications may that have for testing intravenous formulations of vaccines and clinical trials going forward. I am not aware. Maybe uh, Andy, you have, or uh, Rafi, if you have experience with prior vaccines, intravenous uh, laboratory uh, with uh, laboratory animals has been done, but I, I'm, I'm not aware of it. Uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to answer that question because I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure there are experiments with a safety endpoint. And one of the difficulties is that um, the safety endpoints that are picked up are incredibly rare. So to do those in an animal study in, in the laboratory, you, you would need probably tens of thousands, maybe millions of animals. So it, it, I think it's really challenging to properly answer the question. And I, and I think related to this, the point that you made about um, the viral vector vaccines, which are you know, across the board have been associated with the adenoviruses, with thrombosis, thrombocytopenia, there are, there are lots of publications where people are sure they know the mechanism uh, for what's happened. But the problem is that we don't have the animal models. So however much uh, you know, uh, the scientific community comes up with, it's the charge on the viral particle or it's uh, some particular uh, um, expressed protein on the surface, you, you can do the in vitro phenomenology and you can come up with a hypothesis. But what we're lacking today is a way of testing that so you can actually modify uh, viral vectors and remove the issue. So I think that's the, the big challenge we have. So I will just add up here that in both these uh, studies where TTS was given intravenous for the mice and similarly myocarditis, and uh, people were basically coming up that when such large number of individuals receive vaccine, occasionally uh, micro, minute amounts of vaccine may enter into this circulation and whether that could be the reason. So, uh, but this has opened up a new area that uh, 
as safety endpoints uh, to look for some. Uh, it, one may not know what what can be those safety endpoints, but administering to the animals, uh, laboratory animals, intravenously, and to see if uh, if uh, safety signals appear there. But uh, prior to the, uh, the those, because primarily the vaccines for our children, it is for the first time that adults have been given in such a large number. 